all know that you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover. We always get told that surfaces, surface appearance is not what's important, physical appearance isn't important, even physical attractiveness isn't important. And someone isn't good or special or any other great characteristic just because they're attractive. Some of us also grow up thinking, well, they're only saying that to me because I'm not in that category that they call attractive. Because the truth is, we can all see in our experience of daily living that appearance does matter. We all go around in our everyday lives responding to other people on the basis of their appearance all the time. Whether it's about their physical beauty or something else about their appearance that makes them um, that makes us assume and judge a whole bunch of things about them. The, the, the impact of other people's appearance on us is shown simply in the impression that we make about them, the beliefs that we have about them, and even our behavior towards them. Who we choose to help, who we choose to hire, who we choose to be with who we choose to ask out on a date. All of these things are strongly affected by appearance. Appearance matters, despite everything that they told us. Why does appearance matter? Is it really just because we are vain or that for some reason we value beauty above other things? What could that reason be? Is it Again, a shallowness, a vanity of some kind? Is it just because beauty is pretty and therefore I want it more than I want something that is not beautiful? So we need to have a look at our choices. Why are they affected by appearance? Is there anything we can do about that? And is there anything that we can do, no matter what our own individual appearance is, to enhance the positive effect that beauty has on other people for ourselves without seeing a plastic surgeon. We could stand on a high horse and say appearance shouldn't matter. The fact is that it does. I mean, appearance even matters in situations where it really has nothing to do with the situation and kind of shouldn't. But we're human beings. We react to faces. So when someone is giving evidence in a criminal court, the research shows that the jury members or even a judge can be affected by the appearance of that witness. Physically attractive witnesses are more frequently believed by juries and people who are either unattractive or there's something about their physical appearance that makes other people judge them as less than, as poor, as uh, unhygienic, or as plain old ugly, or any of those kind of things. This makes the jury members believe that they are not telling the truth. There is a direct correlation between facial appearance and the outcome of criminal justice court cases. There is a direct relationship proven in evidence between facial appearance and the outcome of elections. Now, looking at some of the world leaders, you might doubt that they have been chosen because of their physical attractiveness. And of course, it really, it, it, by the time you get into the leadership, it isn't really that criterion anymore, um, because there it's become now a choice of one or two or three people and now you might still get it on, on physical appearance, you might not have that option anymore. But when it's a local election or a parliament or congress where there's a lot of possible candidates, as opposed to just a couple, the ones that are physically attractive, tend to get the most votes. There's just no getting around it. That in the world as we know it, you're better off if you're physically attractive. It doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter what you actually do. The first criteria in your likelihood of general success or going forward in life 
is physical attractiveness. There are lots of cliches, which of course are generally true, about you know attractive people who get away with um, conning other people, with being deceptive, all because we want to believe that they're telling the truth because they're physically attractive. Attractive people are generally judged more favorably, not only in a court of law. They're generally treated better than other people. They kind of, we give them more space. We cut them more slack. And even when it comes to our own children, research demonstrates that mothers will favor more attractive babies over the ones that are, for some reason, deemed not attractive Teachers have been shown to favor more attractive students and rate them as smarter and even give them better grades. Attractive adults get paid more for their work and have better success ratings. They also have better luck at dating and making relationships. Everything I'm saying is coming from research just like the fact that juries generally will find an attractive person um, not guilty and an unattractive person guilty. Or, if, of course, there's often more criteria than just that, and there are plenty of attractive people who are found guilty, but those ones, of course, receive lighter sentences than the ones who aren't. You know, I'm sure you're sitting there like me thinking, I cannot imagine anything more unfair than that. And you would be right. But unfortunately, it remains the truth. There's something deeper in us that responds to attractiveness. It sounds shallow and frustrating and disappointment, disappointing. But obviously, there's some very much deeper response that makes us behave in that way. And if there is such a deeper response, what could its value be? What could its function be? We often speak about things as having an evolutionary function. Why did it develop that way? And if it did develop that way, there must be a good reason for it. And so evolutionary psychologists have done a lot to try and understand why we behave this way in the face of physical attractiveness. Certainly, something that helps us understand that this is a kind of evolutionary issue and it's not just a shallow cultural issue um, is really that across individuals, across culturally, um, even across age, there's generally a consensus on what constitutes beauty in a human face. The basic evidence, you know, part, I'm not going to go too much into the specifics. We know that it's largely to do with symmetry in males, strong bone structures, in feminine, softer appearance in females. You know, there are all those qualities I don't want to go into too much about that here. But they are generally agreed on. And because they do seem to be related to aspects of physicality, it's assumed that they are also then evolutionary for a reason. The general conventional wisdom that uh, attractiveness preferences are acquired through life experience, through early experiences, through specific people who might have an influence, have generally not been shown to hold up in research. One of the reasons is that research goes back as early as six-month-old babies, and six-month-old babies prefer to look at the same relatively attractive adult human faces that adults themselves do. So it seems like we wired to understand what beauty is and to respond to it. So as I said, that's where evolutionary psychologists have stepped in and helped us understand that the human face is really a view into other human characteristics which might indicate their suitability as a partner. So it's a coded way of understanding good genes, that's going to be good for my offspring, or strength, that's going to be good for my offspring, or whatever. Our response to each other is based on this 
assumption, this, this instinctive assumption, that physical appearance is a reflection of deeper genetic characteristics. Some of the things that we read from each other that way are beyond the theoretical idea of strong genes and even go as far as something like health. We draw a parallel between attractiveness and good health. More recently, we've seen an alternative approach than what the evolutionary psychologists had long suggested as the main reason why we respond to beauty that way. And this is what's called the ecological approach. The reason why facial appearance matters so much is because some facial qualities are so useful in guiding adaptive behavior. So that means that at an instinctive level, we're able to read from a person's physical appearance that they have literally made genetic adaptations to various changes over time and the environment, ecological adaptation. So we, we can de detect from a person's appearance that essentially their genes have survived better. So it's not really just qualities that we want, such as, you know, strong jaw bones indicate strength. But it's more like recognizing that this individual has an overall stronger genetic pattern, that they've adapted, can deal with different environments. And similarly, it's generally assumed that the error made by that generalization to the, to the human animal, the error made by generalizing about what someone's genetic adaptation has been is less than the error made by choosing someone who doesn't show any kind of adaptiveness at all. Obviously this is working at a very deep level, but this is a theory that is gaining better currency and that really suggests it's beyond wanting certain specific qualities and more recognizing the survivability, the effectiveness of those genes as human genes, as opposed to there are specific qualities I want that I respond to when I see an attractive person. It might sound a little dubious or ridiculous to some people that we could be doing that, but actually we do that all the time. In fact, we need to do that in order to survive ourselves we would probably be completely overwhelmed by the world if we had no way of kind of knowing what to expect in any environment, at least some idea of what to expect, whether that environment is about people or about the physical world itself. What we always do in any situation is we generalize from what we know. And so we generalize from the known to the unknown, and then that allows us to narrow our choices, make hopefully more successful choices in a situation that we don't know. So we might not have been to this place before, or we might not have been amongst these people before. But based on their behavior, I'll make some generalizations based on what I know about other people who've behaved that way, or what I know about my own society when they behave that way, and I'll make certain assumptions about these other people and these new people, and that will allow me to interact with them and engage in a way that makes sense. That is an instinctive behavior we do all the time in order to survive socially. So the environmental approach is really saying we do the same with physical attractiveness. We're making certain generalizations in order to identify what we need, and that is a partner with strong genes, or still assume the right genes. Um, strong genes meaning survivability and adaptability. And that's what we apparently are always going for. So that's what we are generalizing from the known to the unknown. And, and things like symmetry are that kind of generalization because the the evolutionary approach is the one that said we go for what we like and that's you know what's going to show us that a person is has got the characteristics we want 
whereas the environmental approach is saying we actually average it all out and by going for the average we get the most variety so for example a person who's got the most symmetrical face has evolved from all the different extremes um, not from a line of symmetrical people which we know to be in the minority let's say good-looking people are in the minority so when we find a good-looking person it means that in their genetic history are people with very unsymmetrical faces like they are for all of us but if it's arrived at a point where everything looks symmetrical which we know to be rarer that must be the average of everything that's gone before the end result of everything that's gone before then that reads to us as this person is more adaptable and survivable because of their varied complex genes that have led them to this more harmonious end result. It sounds like we could be extracting a whole lot of information that we don't know is there, but we do that all the time. And of course, we see other animals do it all the time. The ability to read and respond to each other is deeply genetically programmed and if survival of a species is what the members of the species are always trying to do in their instincts that draw them to each other then the environmental approach makes sense when it says we're going to be drawn to someone who we can assume has got adaptable genes and the fact that they're physically attractive means that they've got adaptable genes because only by continuously adapting did their genes change from that ugly, that unsymmetrical, that tall, that short, etc. to get them to the point of this even harmonious look. So the evolutionary still reason why we're attracted to attractiveness is not a vanity and it's not a choice of particular characteristics it's a recognition that that person has highly adaptable genes and that adaptability is the key to survivability in the world that is then why it gets translated into those other types of characteristics or other situations such as we perceive them as more socially competent we perceive them as more powerful we perceive them as more intelligent more healthy, more sexually adept, which isn't about that is true. It is simply because those are the characteristics that adaptable people will have. They are the people who are powerful in the world and who will survive. So social competence or power or sexual prowess are assumed to be characteristics which help us get on in the world. And so the physical attractiveness at the base of that is the first of those. We know that it does help people get along in the world. But adaptability and survivability is looking for the genes that are going to get along in the world. So we read those people as highly adaptable and survivable and therefore having competence and power and prowess and all of those things I've mentioned before. And that's how we end up in court assuming that the attractive person is innocent or that they don't need as much punishment or that they should be hired. The connection between their attractiveness and a presumed positive characteristics for dealing with a difficult world is what actually makes us make that connection. On the other end of the spectrum, we perceive unattractive people more negatively than attractive people because unattractive faces show more similarity to what we perceive as unhealthy people and less adaptive people therefore as well so the idea that attractiveness um, creates all this goodness around it such as innocence and sexual prowess and intelligence and always and, and all those kind of things is not so much that we think beautiful is good it's more like we think ugly is bad because we associate ugly with genetic fault or bad lifestyle, or bad food, or something like that. We associate ugly with unhealthy. So we like attractive because attractive means it's not bad, it's not unhealthy, rather than meaning beautiful is good. 
what does the research show about what we can do to enhance our attractiveness since we obviously can't attract, uh, change our genes? I mean, are those of us without fantastic genes doomed? Not at all. Once we understand that what is perceived as attractive is a reflection of deeper good qualities, which are presumed to exist. I'm not saying they necessarily do, but that's the instinctive assumption that we make. Then we can start increasing those qualities too. And it works in simple ways. For example, you might not be as sexually attractive as that good-looking movie star, and so you find yourself doomed in that way. But you can do things, avoid doing things, that people tend to do in relationships, and that is they stop taking care of their physical appearance, they start going around the house in, you know, in their bed clothes and not really taking care of their appearance. And it's great that you get to be so comfortable after a while in a relationship, but you actually need to maintain the signal that says, I'm adaptive, I'm with you, I'm the right choice for each other. You know, so maintaining our physical appearance is a reflection of maintaining health, maintaining adaptability. And that is why we still need to take care of our physical appearance once we're really in our relationships. It's not just a shallow matter. There's also the basics that, of course, your physical appearance and how you manage yourself is also an indication of what you think about yourself. Self-respect, being well-groomed, making sure that you fit and healthy are all measures of self-respect. We transmit the message, I'm okay in any kind of situation. I know how to take care of myself. I manage to make myself look good no matter what the situation. We sometimes think people are so shallow when they do that, when they take care of their appearance in the most extraordinary, ridiculous of situations or the most harrowing of situations. And we think how vain or shallow they are to take care of their physical appearance under such circumstances. But the truth is, it's not vanity. It's a signal that says, I adapt, I manage myself no matter what. And we transmit that by physical appearance. Because how else can we quickly transmit a message to another human being that we don't know about what our genes say? We can only do it by physical appearance. And we're reading each other's emotions in our faces as well. So one of the quickest ways to create positive beauty is to smile. Smiling has a profound effect on other human beings and makes us read as more attractive. So we can actually enhance our attractiveness to other people simply by smiling, which is very powerful and demonstrates that it's not just the shallowness of you look like a movie star. So even though we can't judge a book by its cover, the cover does tell us a lot of things. It doesn't tell us everything, but it gives us good clues about what's inside the book. People do judge books by their cover, but a beautiful cover makes a person read the book more closely. So taking care of our own appearance makes people want a closer look. It isn't just about the surface. Our friend Marcus Aurelius, the great Stoic, of course, did have something to say about beauty. And the Stoics themselves, um, they didn't see beauty as being in the eye of the beholder or a quality that, you know, is above other qualities. To the Stoics, beauty is the end result of a person who exudes the four cardinal virtues, wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. To the Stoics, the good and the beautiful, far from being opposite each other, are two facets of a life well lived. So, in the end, beauty does count, especially when it comes from within. If more beautiful people push the message, we could get more people to do the right thing and get the vaccine. Do it yourself and I'll see you here next week.